You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur. It is an honor to, to come together to worship the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and to know that we have one very important, amazing, supreme source of knowledge and, and wisdom for us, which is the Word of God. So I encourage you to open your Bibles, get your heart ready as you do that. We all want to go to the Word. And isn't it wonderful to, to get together and worship God in songs and worship Him with the beautiful hymns and songs that we sing and, and prayers, right? But let's keep that same heart and go with the same spirit to the Word of God because this is ultimately the highest uh, place of worship in the church. So let's, let's get our hearts ready. Today we're going to read from Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a wonderful piece it's, it's beautiful, it's in deep, and by no means we're going to uh, exhaust everything in here and, and, and read it exhaustively, but we're just going to touch and, and go study a little bit from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15, all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 23. But before that, I want to give you a little bit of background of what is Ephesians looking like and what was that. Ephesians was a very beautiful city in the ancient Rome, uh, Empire, Roman Empire, and it was called the Queen of East for a reason, because it was a very beautiful place. Um, it, it was a very, very important port for the uh, Roman Empire, and it was powerful in knowing that there were Temple of Diana there and a lot of things there. So, so the image of Ephesians is like that. But, but before that, I want you to acknowledge that these words are not just written words of some guy named Paul in the Bible that we open up and we read and we try to understand. This is the very Word of God. So when we come to this, we need to acknowledge God decreed all of these things little by little to come together, every single word from the mouth of Paul, every single letter counts, every single word counts. And as we get close to that, I want us to look at a very beautiful uh, quote from uh, Matt Chandler. It says, if you are not confident in the authority of the scripture, you will be a slave to what sounds right. You know, that is very important. I think, I think we all need to acknowledge what is the ultimate authority. And what, is, what is really important for us to see in the Word of God. Because there is some very, very, very confusing things around the world, in churches, everywhere, that gets us. We're not exactly sure what is the core for us. What is the heart of Christianity? Many people ask me, since you know I was not born a Christian, many people ask me, so what is the, re what is, what is the essence of Christianity? And I hold this book to them and I say it, this is everything that you need to know about Christ and Christianity. But what it means, is it like only this and whatever people think about it? Or is it to itself? Because if you want to think other people's idea and opinion on this word, you will be losing track of what is important. So that's the first part I want us to be able to get focused on that. I think it's important for all of us to acknowledge that we are looking at a very, very important part of our lives. So, now what is, what is this passage about? Let me read a little bit of that uh, and, and then we go from there. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. This is verse 15. And what is it doing? It's giving us a reason first for the beginning of what is Paul talking about. He started his conversation with the Ephesians. This is a letter to Ephesians, but not only to Ephesians. It's going to be circled around every other church in the region, and they're going to read it. Everyone's going to read it. And the beauty of this text comes from the, the way that it is structured. So the first free, uh, few verses of this uh, text is actually greetings. In the first three verse. Verse 3 all the way to 14 is one big sentence. 
And if you know Greek, you will be able to discern how that functions. Well, now it's not very clear, but, but because it's in English, but when you read that in a different language, you will see how beautifully he's connecting all of these ideas together to give us some very important things. Then once he's establishing his understanding, his presuppositions, he's going to verse 15 and all the way to the end of chapter 1. He is praying for the church. So it's all about prayer. It is all about how we are to pray and how he prayed for the church. It is teaching us what is the meaning of prayer and how, how we are going to connect all of these to help us to understand the perspective that we need to have. So, and then, that, that is why he says, in the beginning, I mean, I mean, I want you to have your finger right at the word because it's important, because we want to exercise that. We want to have our fingers on the words so that we know exactly what I say is not from my own, but it's from, from the word of God. And that makes it authoritative. That makes it valuable. That makes it awesome. That makes it worshipful. So, then verse 16, he says, I, uh, if you remember, you, you know, in the, in the beginning, it says, heard of your faith. So keep in mind the word faith. And then keep in mind the word love for all the saints, right? Keep these ingredients. We're going to have something very beautiful coming out of that. So the first one is faith. And then he gives a reason for that. And then the love, he says in verse 16, I do not cease giving thanks for you. So that's the manner and the attitude he's praying for this church. While making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And that's the end of verse 17. What is happening here? He is praying for Ephesians. But Paul is not just praying in quiet time with the Lord. He is praying for them, but he's writing it to them. What is the reason? Because he wants everyone to know this prayer. He could have prayed in, in his room and not write it down to Ephesians. He could have prayed for them, never telling anyone. But he prayed for them and he wrote it down to them because he wants them to understand that as well. So there's a value to hearing the prayer. And what is happening is that he's encouraging them to see. He's encouraging them to come to understanding. To what is understand? What is that wisdom? He used the word wisdom. He used the word revelation. What are these words? And, and there's a beauty in the way that he is choosing every single word in connection to the other words, you know. It's connect, he's connecting Lord Jesus Christ to the Father and the Father of glory. So keep the glory in mind as well. We kept faith and we kept love and then glory in mind. And then he's, he's telling them that God will give you a spirit of wisdom. Now, what is this wisdom? Because if you are looking at the text, it is telling you it's a spiritual wisdom. It is not a normal wisdom. It is not an earthly wisdom. Your earthly wisdom will tell you, oh, this is right and this is wrong. This is how it makes sense. And without spiritual wisdom, you will not be able to see the beauty of this word. You see, you need to go back a little bit, or maybe perhaps we all need to go back a little bit in the past and see what Paul's life looked like in the past. If you have read the book of Acts, you know in Acts chapter 9, Paul is getting blinded by Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's asking us to be enlightened with the wisdom. Do you understand the connected, connection between these two? Because it's beautiful. He got blinded on the road to Damascus. He was going to persecute Christians. Don't make a mistake. He was worshiping Jehovah. He was a good Pharisee. He was doing all the religious things right. But that wasn't enough. Because many of us right now trying to do our religious stuff, but not worshiping Christ the way He is. And that is what I'm trying to do. The central verb for this sermon is enlightenment, is to give spiritual sight. 
that is the word that we are going after. Maybe you feel you are spiritual. You might not be spiritual. If you would ask Paul when he was a Pharisee, are you a spiritual? He would tell you perfectly he is. And if you would ask him, are you a very good godly person? He would say, I perfectly am. And, and I'm so godly that no one can tell me I'm not godly. In fact, I, I do everything for God. So don't make a mistake. Just feeling godly doesn't mean that you're godly. But you need to go to the Word of God, to the knowledge of Christ, to understand what is the true light of Christ. So what was Paul's experience? It's very beautiful. Because he was going to persecute Christians. And you know what God did? Christ appeared to him. and He made him blind. Yes. He could not see for three days. And then what happened? At the end of the three days, his eyes were open. And then he could see, but he was no longer the Paul in the past, the Paul who felt that he's so religious and so godly. All he could see was Christ. And that's what he le- lived after that. You can see, for, if, you, if you want, you can go ahead and do a little study on the life of Paul. How many kilometers he walked. He walked around the entire Roman Empire walking. I think we don't want to walk to church usually. We want to drive, right? <laughs> Because it's too far, eh? we're going to sweat, you know, and stuff like that. But Paul was walking around the Roman Empire. You know why? Because he could see Christ. So I'm not standing here to tell you that every one of us is so good and we are so awesome and we can see everything. Or you are very godly and spiritual. But the, the reality is that I'm calling you to prayerfully consider who he is. And thankfully praise Him for what He did for us to give us the riches of His glory as an inheritance so that we would be His church and live as the body of Christ. This is a statement that I want you to have in your heart to prayerfully consider. We can think that we are spiritual and we might not be spiritual. So that is very important. But then... From verse, uh, let's, let's go to verse 17 one more time and just, just check it out. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Then verse 18 say, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. Let's pause there. Do you see the word hope? So do you want to... Do you want, I, I love to do this. I love to connect this trio of, of Paul. He always has his own faith, hope, and love together. Because these are the things that functions to help us and to help everyone to know the perspective and the direction of our love for God and the direction of our walk with God. So he's calling us. But he's telling us there's a calling. There's a hope in our calling. What is your calling? Because Paul could hear the call. But can you hear the call? That is very important. We need to understand that. And then after that he says, What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjugation under his feet, and give him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, at the bottom of your notes, you may find out four different things. I want you to prayerfully 
consider which part of your faith needs prayer, needs change. Because we all have blind spots. It is very important. Every single one of us have some blind spots in our faith and journey with God. Some of us, you might not be even a believer. Then you need to have faith in Christ. You need to understand who He is and believe in Him. Believe in His work and His identity. Who He is and what He did for you. So that's the first point. Saying who we are. You see, we are not what the world defines us to be. If the world is defining you, you are enslaved to the world. It's very simple. It's very simple. You are enslaved to whatever defines your identity. So who we are, we are His children. And that's what Paul is praying. You see, Paul, Paul's prayer, I could not decode everything together because he is writing in a wonderful language. If I wanted to open up everything, uh, it would have taken a few hours. Probably we don't want to do that. And <laughs> I just want to make sure we have a very short yet comprehensible understanding of what's going on with the text. But when he is talking about this enlightenment of us, he wants us to see everything. Everything. The word in Greek to, for enlightenment is photizo. What is photizo? Photizo is coming from the root of the verb that if I use that word, you immediately remember. Photo or photography. That word comes from photizo. But what is photizo is enlightenment. To give light. To bring to light. To be able to see that. So, how this is connecting. The first point for us is to understand who we are. You need to prayerfully ask yourself who you are. Not only who you are in Christ, but who you are when you're not in church, when you're at home, when you're at work, when you're driving. Who you are. You need to understand, do you always see yourself as His child? Because it's important as individuals, we need to see ourselves as, as God's children. But do you see yourself? Because I, I have to confess, no one's perfect and I am not. Sometimes I wake up and until 10 o'clock, I don't feel like I'm the child of God, you know. That's, that's for me. And sometimes you do too. Let's be honest with what we are. Let's be honest. We don't want to create a mask. I'm tired of those masks who would tell you, oh, I'm such a wonderful and beautiful Christian that would never make mistakes and never fall and never... No, we all will fall. But let's keep our balance. Let's keep our eyes to the Lord so that we can walk with Him. Be honest with yourself. So sometimes we forget we are His children. But not only that, we are also His body and His church. What, what that means, that's a different aspect of our life because verse 22 and 23 is talking about that. That we are Christ's body. What is happening is He is teaching us and telling us what we need to know about our church life. Do you feel connected to the people around you? Do you know them? How many people you know? How many people you meet outside of the church setting? How many times you get together to pray? How many times you text someone and say, Oh, I'm praying for you. Have you ever done that? Well, if not, then you have to ask, then who you are as a church? Do you have a church identity? Because if, if you don't have it, then, then you need to work on that part. That's a very, very important point. We need to understand that this is what we need to know. So that's our first point from the beginning to understand who we are. And if you are questioning that, you need to prayerfully consider who God is and thankfully praise Him for what He did for us to give us the riches of His glory as an inheritance so that we would be His ch uh, church and live as the body of Christ. This is what we are looking for. Now the second point is what He did for us. Because if you and I don't know what He did for us. We cannot know who we are without knowing what He did for us. 
How can I know what I am be, without knowing what He did for me? I, I need to know uh, what He did for me. That's important. Because He redeemed us. Now, are you redeemed? That's a very important question. Are you redeemed? You need to, yes, it should come out of you. You should say, yes, I am. And there should be, a, there should be a emotion attached to that uh, knowledge. Not only knowledge alone, but, but the emotion of saying, yes, I know. I know that I am redeemed. But how do you know that? Because of your church going? Or are, you, are you assigning some religious stuff to yourself to say, I do this and this and this and this? Therefore, I feel religious. Therefore, I, see, I feel saved. Or do you trust in Christ and His blood for salvation? Because verse 20 is talking about that. Look at verse 20. It says, which He brought about in Christ. What, what He brought about in Christ, our redemption. When He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. What that means? That means... God exalted Christ so that we as children connected to Him as His body will be lifted with Him. You know how awesome it is to be connected? You know how awesome it is to be redeemed? But only, not only redeemed. Because redeemed is only the one whose the penalty is being paid for. But also adopted. You see this adoption is the meaning of grace. Is the extension of His love for what He did for us. He took our blame. You and I, on a daily basis, fail to glorify God. And that's, that's the honesty of our lives. And if you think you never fail to glorify God, then you're just dishonest with yourself. You need to work on there. Because we always do. Is there anyone in the room that... Ne that Never sinned for the last week. Because that's impossible. It's impossible for us not to sin. But yet again, it is impossible for children of God not to walk in the light. You see, we are not working on giving license to sin. No. That is no license to sin. But that is freeing us from the religious mindset that keeps you and me thinking that we need to work for our salvation. That's the point. Now what is this adoption? This adoption is telling us that we are His children. We are called to be His. But what is this calling? What is God's calling? God's calling is connected to where you are, who you are, and how He's going to use your life. You might be called in your workplace to be the light and you might not see that calling. See, the whole point is to see, is the enlightenment. And my prayer is that you would be enlightened to see that. But are you able to see? Because that is powerful. That is what we need to see and understand. Then we need to know that the power of God works in everything around us. So it's not that we are His children and we are set apart from this world in a sense that we never get engaged with this world. No. We go back to this world, we get connected to this world and look for the opportunities to glorify Him, to bring others, to bring people around us to this knowledge and wisdom of Him so that we would answer the same calling that He gave us. He called us. What is this calling? This calling for each of us is different. Yours is different than the one sitting beside you. You have a special, very, very specific calling from God. And your calling might be living the way that you live, not the same as you live but to, to the fullness of Christ. You see, I'm not standing here to tell you that your life is perfectly good and you don't need to change anything. That's not what I'm intending to do. I think we need to know 
how glorious these things are. But unless we are willing to come out of our, our, our own comfort zone and put down the idol of comfort and walk with God, do the things of God, worship Him, walk for Him, with Him. If you're not doing that, then you need to pray before anything else, before trying to obey with your own strength, which you will never be able to do, by the way. Before that, you need to pray for, your, for the eyes of your own heart. Because the eyes of your own heart needs to be opened, and that's the point. So, we need to understand the power of God. Then the third point for us is who He is. Because how can we know what He really did? See, we started from who we are, right? And then we said, okay, if, if we want to know who we are, but we need to know what He did for us to make us who we are, right? And then after we understood what He did for us to make us who we are, we need to know who He is to know what He did. Is cross trustworthy? That's a very powerful question. Is cross trustworthy to redeem me? Can I trust that? Can I trust that gospel? Can the gospel of Jesus Christ be trusted? Well, if you look at verse 21 and 22, you will see a lot of that. He is all-powerful. I'm just summarizing this because we're not going to go through all the details. Obviously, we're not able to do that. But He is all-powerful. That's very important. But what that means, that means all of the power in the world, available to everyone, including the ones that we don't agree with or the ones we doubt, all of them connected to Him, and He is the source, the ultimate source of every power in the world, which means history is going exactly the way He wants. Otherwise, you would be able to doubt the sovereignty of God, which is impossible. So either everything is in his hand or he's not God. That's the argument. There's no better argument for that. And the calling for all of us is to wake up and to be able to see what is his power. So he is all powerful. Well, not only in our age or not only in the New Testament or not only for the future to come, in every age. What that means in the past, uh, series, sermon series we studied about the coming of Christ and how He's going to redeem His people and how powerfully we have hope in that. So He is powerful in every single age, every single time, every era of history as well. But do you know what God did in history? Have you ever thought to yourself, well, maybe I need to know because if I know the past, it might help me to understand where I am. And what am I going to do in future? Many times churches are living in ignorance about the past. And therefore they cannot be working and functioning nice and efficiently for the future. What is it? Because we don't know our perspective. We don't know where we are in the redemption history. Do you know your specific calling and role in the redemption? Are you using that? Or you just think you are not in that journey. You are just the audience who come and sit down and watch the, watch the show. See, that's not what I'm asking you to do. Church is not... There are three different types, perhaps. Some people come and see and watch. Well, I just call you not to be that, please. It's, let's get that. <laughs> All right? Let's not, let's not be the one who sit down and watch. There are other ones who are working behind the scene to help uh, things go well. Um, well, that's also not bad, but, but try not to be that as well. There's the third one who's leaving it. He is at the center of the drama, in the drama of our lives. The meaninglessness of this world is killing millions. And the only true meaning of life 
is found in Christ. And I want all of us to be able to say, I don't want to sit down and watch. I don't want to work on the background. I want to be the one who lives for Christ. Like every second Christ is looking at me. Like Father knows every moment of my life. And that's beautiful and that's powerful. Isn't it powerful? Isn't it beautiful to think, oh, I shouldn't be sitting back there. I shouldn't be doing something for Christ. Christ is not the nice cherry on top of our cupcake. He should be the entire food on our table, which He is. So, what is the point of this for us? The third one, the, the last point is what we ought to do. And that's important. So we need to understand His sovereignty. See, if you acknowledge He is in control of everything, it will immediately change the way you understand and perceive the world. You will no longer look at yourself as someone who is in the middle of a storm with a bunch, a series of meaningless incidents and dramas in your life. Because every one of us has some sort of problem. Everyone has something. But have you realized that the season of this problem, the moment the season of this problem finishes, the season of another problem starts, right? And then all your attention is just about the next problem. And then the next problem. You know what is it doing? It takes away the power and ability to walk with the Lord. Your ability to glorify Him. So that is the next point. But what should we do? What we ought to do. Because it's important. What we ought to do. Now here's the point. You see, many times we don't follow Christ. That's one wrong understanding. And some of us follow Christ and obey Him. But when you do that, you immediately start to turning back to those who do not follow and start shouting at them, say, hey, come and do this. Do that. Obey God. Obey Christ. But that's not enough. You know why is it not enough? Because if you don't go from who we are and what He did for us and who He is, you cannot ask someone to say or to understand what they ought to do. Can they? No. That's important to understand that we need to have all these four pieces together. Together, it only makes sense so that we understand who we are. We are His children. But what He did for us, He, he came from heaven. He went up the cross. He was resurrected to give us eternal life. Okay, who He is. He truly is God. Okay, now that we, need, we know all of these things, we are in the line story of our life. See, our lives are journeys that needs to be walked. You are walking already in your journey. But if you tune your mind to the work of God, you will be able to walk with Him precisely in every step. Do not be confused when the Things of this world is giving you different stuff. And that is very, very important. So, now we need to understand that. And, and, and how, how do we practically work, uh, work that in our church? We worship Him. You come for worship because that's important. And then you walk with Him. That's important. And then you work for Him. And that is also important. Well, what, is, what does this thing mean? This thing doesn't mean that you come as a religious person, give, worship, check. You make yourself a checklist. I worship Christ this week, check. I walk with Christ this week, check. I work for Christ this week, check. That is not how you do life. That is not how we do it. So how do we do it? We worship out of our hearts out of the gratitude that functions in our hearts. Remember that at the beginning of this text, 
uh, Paul uh, was telling them that he is thankfully praying for him. What is that? Because he is worshipful in his mind. So, connecting all of these together, I want us to come to this conclusion to understand how is this going to work and how is this going to function. Looking at the picture, you have from the beginning, you have faith in your mind, you have love, you have hope, and then all these things are going to go to glory, the glory of God. But then you need to be able to answer those four questions. Which part of your life is lacking? Which part of your life is not functioning in the way it's supposed to? How is, it, how is your, your spiritual walk with Christ is hindered by which one of those things? You see, when we say worship Christ, we come to church to worship. And this is a part of worship. A part of worship that is not only glorifying Him, but also searching our own heart. Searching our own heart to see where we are and what we ought to do. Who we are to understand all of that. So then, you have that one. And then you have the other one. The other one is the walk with Christ. You need to be able to find your journey with Christ. Not just to say, I'm walking with Christ. The walk with Christ doesn't mean that you come and volunteer something in church sometimes. That is not. Your walk with Christ should be daily engagement with His Word. Are you daily engaging in this Word? Because if not, everything else is feeding you how much your social account is feeding you, how much your phone is feeding you, how much the world is feeding you, is you're eating on those things. Now, I'm not saying we should break all the devices. Please don't go home and break all your devices. As, as oh, the preacher said, break your device. No, don't do that, all right? But, but listen to this. Find a balance in there. Find a balance in there. Do you spend time in the Word of God? Do you read it for yourself? Have you ever, ever sit down and open this Word and say, there is the Word of life. Christ in the Word can be revealed to me. Do you know what is the word for... Let's, let's just go there. The word for revelation is apocalypsis. I know it sounds like apocalyptus, but it's not. So it, it means to open up something, to open up something to show the depth and that is revelation. Where do you see Christ? Some people claim that they see Christ here and there and that that is wrong. The only important, trustworthy source of knowing Christ is His Word. No one knows Christ better than Bible. It's absolutely true. No one knows Christ better than Bible. And the Bible can give you what you need to know and what you need to understand in regards to that. So as we go, then, okay, as we go to grow in our walk with Christ, then we get to, to the next point that is working for Christ. Now, what is, why is it the last one? Do you know the order matters as well? Do you know why is it the last one? Because when you are mature enough, when you're walking with Christ, then you only work for Christ. Because if your heart does not understand if your intentions and desires behind what you do is wrong, all that you do never matters. You can come to church and serve a lot, or you can never come and never serve in any area. I tell you, if you're serving and your desire is to fulfill some religious duties that you have from the back of your mind for some reason, you are absolutely wrong. That is not good. You need to go and check your heart again. Find out how you serve God. For what reason? Is it out of the grace that's been given to you? Because your cup should be filled with Christ's love. And only once your cup is full, then you overflow from your cup. In this way, you will never be empty and you will serve others. This is the right model. The wrong model is this. I go half full, empty myself, and now I'm empty. I go, I get myself half full. 
That's not how it's going to be. You're going to be to the full, completely filled with Christ's power. And then serve and work for Him out of that. This is the proper walk. This is the proper understanding of the walk. But as the church, how do we do this as a church? Now, that's my individual part. How about my spiritual life in the church? How do we walk together? Do you share the same life? Do we share this life together? Are you connected to your small group? How well are you connected to your small group? Are you going there? Are you investing your time? Now that they are studying Galatians, I know we have a break in our small groups, but that doesn't mean that we cannot see each other. That doesn't mean that we cannot spend time with each other. Are you studying, following God's plan in His church for yourself? Because that's important. Now think about this. And think with me, please. We want to see that the love and faith are functioning. We saw that Paul is praying for them in their hope. And my question for you is this. Do you need to work on your faith? Do you need to work on your love? Or perhaps you need to work in fixing your hope how all these if all these three are together and you know the balance you have are you glorifying God as a direction for that because that's how they function every single time in every single passage of the Bible you can follow whenever Paul is bringing these three he is giving direction to them and the direction for that is his glory which means God's glory now Looking at that, I want you to know and understand how He's forming everything for us. So there's a reason. The reason is the Word of God. The ultimate authority of our lives is this Word. Are you going for answers to somewhere else? To something different? See, we use the word photizo, right? You say that's the Greek word for enlightenment. And I'm just turning to one portion of the Gospel of John, uh, at the chapter 1, verse 9, is a very small verse, but a very powerful verse. Verse 9, chapter 1 in the Gospel of John says, There was the light, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. This is the same exact word that is being used there, the same for Tizo. But what is it? It says, there was the true light. You may see something and you think to yourself, wow, this sounds so good. This sounds so right. That's how we begin our uh, sermon today. That if you don't know the truth of God in His Scripture, you're enslaved to what sounds right. But that's not what we do here. And that's not right for your life. You need to go back to the Word of God to find the true light. And I encourage you. Encourage you to go and think of the things you need to get together and bring together. And as we do all these things, I want us to prayerfully open our hearts to change. Think about it. And think to yourself. In, your, in the heart of your heart, ask God to open your heart and show you what you need to know. So let us bow our head and prepare to pray.